Good afternoon from, from beautiful Barcelona. I am Alexis Rod, CEO of SciTech Diplo Hub, the Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub. Thank you so much for joining us one more year at our SciTech Talks, a series of free online lectures that SciTech Diplo Hub and eBay have put forward uh, with other world-class institutions and leading international experts in science, diplomacy, and global affairs. These three sessions, taking place on the 19th, 24th, and 26th of April, will explore some of the most relevant topics at the intersection of science, technology, and current international affairs. This year, we're gathering global experts in energy diplomacy, health diplomacy, and data diplomacy to discuss new ventures in fusion energy, the global threat of antimicrobial resistance, and how leading geopolitical actors are shaping the global standards for data privacy policy. Today, we will address how nations work together to solve one of the greatest challenges of our time, a clean and limitless source of energy, fusion energy. Imagine a future where we no longer rely on fossil fuels, where energy poverty is a thing of the past, and, when, and where we can mitigate the worst effects of climate change. This future is not far away, as we might think, and is it within our grasp if we can come together to harness the power of fusion? For over 70 years, scientists have been striving to develop new forms of clean and unlimited sources of energy. However, it was not until the resolution of the Cold War that the potential for diplomatic endeavors in this area became clear. The end of the conflict between the West and the, the former Soviet Union opened up new opportunities for international scientific collaboration and joint projects, including in the field of nuclear fusion. Today, ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, stands as a unique contemporary ex exercise in science diplomacy and a significant milestone in the technological history of humanity. This international collaboration involves 35 countries working together to build the largest, most complex fusion device ever created, with the goal of achieving sustainable, controlled nuclear fusion and unlocking its potential as a safe and, and, and virtually limitless source of energy. In today's session, we will delve into the past, present, and future of energy science diplomacy. We will explore how diplomatic actions have played a crucial role in shaping the landscape of fusion research and development, from the early days of scientific partnerships during the Cold War to the current developments in fusion technology. We will also discuss the current state of fusion energy research, including the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. With advancements in fusion technologies, the realization of practical fusion power generation is becoming increasingly promising, but still requires diplomatic efforts to overcome technical, uh, regulatory, and, and financial challenges. As we explore the intricate relationship between science diplomacy and fusion energy, we will also analyze the potential benefits of this clean, safe, and sustainable source of power for the future. From addressing global energy demands to mitigating climate change, nuclear fusion holds immense promise as a game-changing energy source, and a diplomatic action will be critical in its realization. In order to delve deeper into this fascinating field, today we are thrilled to welcome two global experts in energy diplomacy and international relations that will be that we will be moderated by Paul Ruiz, Research Policy and Training Lead Side of the Club. Good afternoon, Paul. Good morning in Washington. The floor is all yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Alexis, and thank you everybody for joining. And what a what a critical conversation, I might say. The one that we're going to have today in a time in which we're talking about how to decarbonize our economies, but also how to become more energy secure and how to reindustrialize uh, both Europe, the US, but also but also the world, while at the same time we provide development opportunities and energy access um, across the globe. Um, while, while we are at it and to tackle these big challenges that we face in decarbonization, energy security and industrialization mm -hmm. or green industrialization, we know that, that electrification is going to be key. Right, um, and that's going to increase demand for electricity. Think about how we're going to use EVs, how we're going to electrify transport, but also things like green hydrogen, we're going to, which are going to use high amounts of electricity. How do we provide this clean but also cheap, safe, abundant uh, uh, electricity to the world is a key question. Um, and fusion can be can be a critical answer. Right, uh, we always say that fusion is forty years away. Uh, where are we now? Um, are we closer than ever uh, to commercialize fusion? What is fusion's role for the transition? How can we collaborate as governments, but also as, as private companies uh, around the world to advance its, its development and its commercialization? And does fusion have any geopolitical implications? We're going to talk a little bit uh, about this. And to do so, we have Matteo Barbarino. Ciao, Matteo, nuclear fusion specialist at the IEA. Welcome. And Mark Robinson. Assistant Professor in Science Diplomacy at SOAS in London. 
Um, I'm going to just jump right in. I know we have a lot to talk about. So let me start with you, Mark. Um, and let me focus a little bit on the international aspect of international collaboration. So we know that large scientific uh, collaborations provide effective models of cooperation, coordination, and communication among very diverse stakeholders to address common challenges. Um, these collaborations can offer tremendous potential to address these complex issues, but they also uh, can, can be fraught with challenges, with unequal power dynamics, with decision-making uh, problems, resource allocation problems, etc. You have experience in the international thermonuclear uh, experimental reactors in ITER. We also know about the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, and how they showcase capacity for scientific, scientific collaboration across, across borders to advance scientific progress. Um, in what ways do you think these big scientific collaborations such as ITER or CERM can inform our understanding on the effectiveness and the significance of science diplomacy, of international science and technology collaboration? And what are the main challenges they face? What are the main insights, insights and learnings do you think that we can extract from them to strengthen collaboration around the world and address, the challenge, address these challenges that, that they may face? Thank you, Powell, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm very pleased to have been invited to take part today. And thank you also to the SciTech Diplo Hub uh, organizers. Uh, what I intend to do, Powell, is answer your questions in a in a 10 minute brief that I'm going to, um, an introductory brief about uh, science diplomacy and fusion. And I think, uh, you know, the challenges are many and varied. Um, and, you know, this is the miracle that the actual collaboration is, is, is set up in the first place. So um, these type of projects intrigue me, you know, not only from the great science and knowledge that they will produce, but from the international collaborations that the, are necessary to establish the teams, uh, build them and operate them over very long time spans. Um, so my research is centered around the question of what is that magic stardust that has been sprinkled on the member states and their government officials that allow them to enter into these collaborations um, in highly expensive, highly risky technical environments um, when they will not exchange the time of day with those member states in other domains. So in other words, how do they overcome what David held and Thomas Hale in their uh, book uh, entitled Gridlock um, in 2013? How do they overcome that gridlock? And Hale and Held defined gridlock as the inability of countries to cooperate via international institutions to address policy problems that span borders. Um, and the feature of this gridlock is that it's actually um, self-reinforcing at the moment. Because of nationalism and other trends, uh, it can be viewed as part of a downward spiral in which gridlock leads to unmanaged globalization of unmet global challenges which in turn help to provoke anti-global uh, backlashes uh, that further undermine the operative ability and capacity of governments and their institutions to collaborate. So, of course, Halen held, like all good academics, they wrote 2013 Gridlock, and in 2019 wrote Beyond Gridlock, which was the solution um, to these uh, problems that existed. And they looked at very uh, varied domains. They looked at finance, energy and climate, uh, human rights, health, cybersecurity, and a little bit on science to, um, collaboration. And they identified four or five pathways through gridlock that have been effective and used um, to form collaborations. And the first was this idea of shift in major powers interests. So if we think about CERN, um, the European movement at the end of the Second World War and the formation of UNESCO and other uh, global institutions gave an opportunity for disciples and um, Sherpas of that community to form CERN. So there's an idea, an example of getting the right moment in time. Another pathway they looked at was autonomous and adaptive international institutions. So where you accrue the authority to be able to speak on a given topic. So for example, the World Trade Organization sets standards on trade and dispute resolution. Another way of, of overcoming this gridlock is technical groups with effective and legitimate processes. An example of that is our um, the co-panelists today, where the IAEA nuclear inspections protocols are respected and used. And then we have 
other softer ways through gridlock. So innovative leadership, inspirational scientific leadership, and also um, very innovative funding mechanisms, uh, which I'll touch on in a, in a little while. So if we look at ITER, and um, we look at how it's been formed. I mean, Bernard Bigot, who's recently passed away, the um, iconic director general for so long of the project, you know, said that providing clean, abundant, safe economic energy will be a miracle for the planet. And I really believe that the, you know, part of the miracle of it is that collaboration between the member states. And this all started off in 1985 between Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, where they were holding the fireside, famous fireside summits in Reykjavik and other places. And Sherpas and uh, disciples of fusion on both sides of the, of the Cold War divide managed to get in a protocol in 1985, this expression of, we believe and we will cooperate for an inexhaustible source of energy for the benefit of mankind. And that few words at the end of that protocol allowed their experts to continue um, to uh, develop the collaborations. They had a certain uh, uh, chemistry between them. They um, were backed by people like Michael Roberts from the Department of Energy and Ev Evgeny Velenkov of the Soviet Union, who were catalysts to make sure that the, um, the momentum was maintained. Velenkov is a very interesting character. He went to university with Gorbachev in Moscow. Uh, Velikov achieved a first in physics and Gorbachev a first in law. They remained friends throughout life and Gorbachev appointed them as his senior scientific advisor. So there they were in 1986 when um, the famous uh, protocol agreement was reached. That then led others to join in on the bandwagon. So we had Japan, we had uh, the, the beginnings of Euratom, and we had various locations started up around the world on the design study for a fusion device. Uh, December 98 saw the US uh, drop out because of worries about costs. Uh, but they rejoined in 2003 after China and South Korea joined the project, unsurprisingly. And then the negotiations went on and on in what can only be termed a diplomatic bun fight over where the um, site was going to be located. After very protracted negotiations and a marvelous um, scientific coup in a in an agreement called the Broader Approach, which was signed the day after the ITER agreement, um, Europe agreed to give up some of their in-kind contributions, some of the work that they were going to do to Japan in order for Japan to agree that the site would be at Calarache in France, where of course it is today. Part of that agreement was also that Japan would get the first two director generals. And I was at ITER during the time of mutajimo san and also Ikida-san before that. So November 21st, 2006, the seven members signed the ITER agreement. It had taken 21 years to achieve that signature. And the ITER agreement itself is 20 pages. There are many, many supporting documents, including all of the procurement arrangements and protocols, but 20 pages, 21 years, is a testament to how difficult these things are to maintain. But of course, that community is quite special. The seven member states, Europe, China, Japan, South Korea, India, Russia, and the USA, represent over half the world's population and over 80% of the world's GDP. 10% of their contribution to it is in cash, 90% is in kind. They even have their own currency, the ITER unit of account. And every day at midnight, the foreground intellectual property on ITER is shared with all the member states' hubs. So Kadarash, that dictatable data is shared. So that's quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. America, China, and Russia share intellectual property on a nuclear project every day. So there it is in beautiful south of France. It is a labyrinth of collaboration and in-kind contributions. It has many problems, but without a doubt, the way that it is funded locks in the members. So for example, and my final few statements before I wrap up, Powell, is when the US regularly looks at pulling out of ITER, and Director General Beagle, for example, had to go over and brief Congress, he points out, of course, that Congress can do anything. They could pull out of the project. But I think he put it in a famous YouTube video as it would probably be one of the worst decisions Congress has ever made. 
because A, they would be cutting off the development work that companies like General Atomics in California are doing for the central solenoid, but also they would ruin the reputation of the US to collaborate on this sort of a scale with European partners in particular again. So they are locked in, in a friendly uh, way, to the project, which allows them to overcome all of the ripples and all of the problems that a project of this size and this longevity go through. So with that power, I'll wrap up for now and um, hand back to you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks for that. And, and that focus on right collaboration and what it means for a country like the US, but also for, for nations that might not agree on, on everything in terms of the bilateral relations, but they can come together in a framework of an organization like this uh, uh, to find solutions for some of the uh, biggest challenges that humanity faces right now, such as the urbanization and the advancement, the advancement of, of fusion energy and what role fusion can play can play in that. Um, I wanted to move to another community, another organization central in the development of, of fusion of fusion energy. Matteo, you sit in a very privileged position at the International Atomic Energy Agency. We know that and we've been chatting, right, developing a fusion energy uh, technology is complex, it's, it's challenging, and it has not yet been, been fully realized, though people say that we're closer, closer than ever to making that happen. Given the complexity of the technology and the significant financial investment it requires, we know that you know a global concentrated effort to pool resources, to pool expertise, to pool knowledge is critical. Um, in this regard, how does the International Atomic Energy Agency serve as, as a hub for fusion research and cooperation? And what initiatives are currently underway to promote the development and also the commercialization of fusion energy? What are in your view, the potential geopolitical implications of bringing nuclear fusion energy to market. <laughs> Thanks, Paul, for having me. Um, very interesting event. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, so as Mark was talking, it reminded me about one of the reasons why I really love working for this agency. And is um, if I had to really pick one, is the, the historical role that the agency played in the in the history of fusion research and in the in the making of fusion energy science diplomacy. And if I could uh, just take a step back and maybe farther the uh, retrospectives that Mark was sharing about uh, how ether came to be. Um, I know it is uh, certainly accepted that the, um, the inception of the ITER project uh, can be identified with the Geneva summit of 90, 1985. Uh, but I, I see that as more as a, the culmination of a lot of groundwork, which uh, was uh, was uh, was prepared, was made uh, in the two decades which uh, preceded uh, the Geneva summit, and it's it's in those two de decades that the agency had a very prominent role. Uh, first, uh, starting to organize a series of fusion energy conferences in the 60s, also thanks to the vision of a committee, which it's called Scientific Advisory Committee which was established in 1959 as a result of another important event, which is the UN um, uh, Geneva Conference in 1958, where nuclear fusion research was declassified. And then another important event was the establishment of something called the International Fusion Research Council within the, within the framework of the IAEA. This council was established in 1971. And Mark talked about how Velikov and um, uh, Roberts, the guy from the US, but uh, both uh, Reagan and uh, Gorbachev being catalyst uh, for, for the birth of ITER. But I, I think this council was another important catalyst for bringing a level of uh, coordination rather than collaboration in fusion research already in the 70s. Uh, they launched something which came to be known as INTOR, uh, International Thermonuclear Reactor Workshop. Uh, which resembles um, the the acronym for for the ITER project. In fact, in, INTOR was just the twin of of ITER. Had the same partners. Uh, it it just didn't realize because ITER then was uh, the the idea of ITER came to be, and so they all the, the same partners: the European Commission, Japan, Russia, ex Soviet Union, and the US. They all uh, rallied around ITER later, and so INTOR was uh, dis discontinued. Uh, so the agencies had this very incredible, important role uh, up to the inception of ITER. It will provide uh, further our species uh, uh, for ITER to, to develop and, and flourish until the actual ITER organization is established in 2007. 
Uh, after that, the, the I and ITER have signed cooperation agreement in 2008. We have uh, deepened this cooperation very recently in 2019 with something that we call practical arrangements. It's mm. just a way for the agency to put in practice um, agreements with other international organizations. We, at the moment, we, we cooperate in, um, in the development of guidance for, for safety um, aspects of, of fusion. We cooperate in education outreach. Um, and training activities, also in developing publications. So th that is what we do with the with the ITER organization, and, and this this uh, this partnership you, you can't imagine it, will, it continues to um, uh, to progress and will 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 take even new new dimensions as the as the ITER project uh, becomes and, and ITER Tokamak becomes operational. Um, in general, instead, what what I, what we do, the most recent initiatives, I think you. Uh, you know, the IA is the global hub for cooperation in the nuclear field. Um, when it comes to fusion, uh, we, we tend to cover all the, all the main pillars. So if you think of the IA around three main pillars, which is science and technology, science, uh, technology, and then uh, safety and security and safeguards, uh, for fusion is the same. So we work around these three main pillars. We, uh, we facilitate and we, we, uh, we, uh, we bring, uh, organizations and member states together to work on fusion R&D research and development, including basic science. Uh, we're now looking into technology development for fusion, including possible synergies with fission technology. We're looking at the legal and institutional aspects of fusion, what it needs to be done in those areas. A uh, new focus also being, made, being uh, posed on, on the safety, security, safeguards aspects and nuclear liability aspects of fusion research. Um, our flagship initiatives remain the IAEA Fusion Energy Conference, which is still ongoing. We have actually the next Fusion Energy Conference will take place in London in October this year, uh, during the, from the 16th until the 21st of October. And it's still open for registration, so I encourage everyone to register. I will put, I will try to put the link on the chat. Um, we have uh, we have a series of uh, workshops focused on improving coordination on the next step machine after ITER, which is commonly referred as to demo or fusion demonstration power plant or pilot plant. A demo, the objective of demo as compared to ITER. So ITER, the objective of ITER if, is to uh, prove the scientific and technical feasibility of fusion energy. So to prove some of the science and technical uh, technological um, um, concept about fusion, including producing some level of heat of fusion energy from the reaction without actually harnessing this energy. Instead, the next step, which is, like I said, it's commonly referred as to demo. So the objective of this next step machines, which will come after it, is to actually produce electricity. So there's different demos being uh, developed uh, different designs of demos being developed, bo both in the private sector and the public sector, and these have different timelines, uh, including different technologies. Some of them, they're, they're even thinking about using different type of fuels. And so we bring all these uh, partners together, also in this area, in the area of demo, to coordinate to some extent all the efforts. Uh, as you already said in your introduction, fusion is a and fusion requires lo lots of effort. So it, it is a the science of fusion is complicated. It's very rigid. Uh, the scale of fusion, the infrastructure also requires uh, investments. So collaboration is a, is a, is a key. Uh, it is key to move to move forward at pace and um, uh, also faster. And yeah, this is probably this is de definitely this is one of the reasons why fusion has enjoyed this high level of uh, of science diplomacy and and and, and collaborate or, or or at least why fusion is uh, such an, a great example of science diplomacy and cooperation. Uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm still doing good on time. There was you had one question on the geopolitical implications of the adoption of fusion. So well, I think so. Commercial fusion energy, I think, will produce. Uh, new geopolitical situations, uh, and uh, an obvious consequence will be in the energy landscape. Of course, in in terms of energy security and independence. So, if we consider the scenario where fusion power plants uh, would um, would rely on deuterium and tritium fuels, which are isotope uh, of hydrogen, um, I think in this case, 
resources like tritium and lithium will become even more uh, more important, more prominent. Of course, lithium is already very important as an asset, but it will become even more uh, even more more prominent as a, as an asset. Um, then there's it is true that fusion could work uh, virtually in every country. So and there is, there is this is why uh, this is one of the reasons why fusion is so important because it, it it could be applied it could work in every jurisdiction. Um, so and, and that's why I think in general fusion may secure long term international peace because of the qualities. It would possibly reduce the energy source related geopolitical tensions. It might also uh, uh, reduce the global north, global south gap. And it might continue to improve or in some cases reestablish um, partnerships or coalitions between, between countries who are not naturally uh, perhaps partners are working together, but fusion may help in that uh, in that uh, in in that context, especially when we, as we just discussed, when we think about what can be done together to accelerate the uh, de development and deployment of fusion energy. Super, super interesting. Let me just flag for everyone the IAEA Fusion Energy Conference that you mentioned, the 29th. Uh, next October 2023 in London for everybody that's that's interested. But thank you for your comment. Super interesting focus on, on collaboration. And I loved that you mentioned the spillover effects that investment in these organizations and uh, in these common research projects between countries have also in terms of, of development and the commercialization of fusion uh, in the private sector and how, how you're working together for that. I wanted to uh, jump into a last question for both of you before we move into some q and I already see some some very interesting questions. Um, and I wanted to focus not on the collaboration, but a little bit more on the on, on the on the last focus on the geopolitics bit. So we've talked about collaboration a lot, no? So Two things. How does competition between countries and our world today is marked, marked precisely, increasingly marked by not only geopolitical, but precisely geoeconomic competition and energy we're seeing plays a big role in, in that geoeconomic competition. So how does geoeconomic competition between countries um, advance uh, fusion development? How does also competition, I would say, in private mm -hmm. players potentially advance uh, uh, the development and commercialization of fusion, and in terms of, of collaboration, what can we do better, right? How can we design strategies, frameworks? Uh, how can we go the extra mile to ensure we deploy uh, fusion at scale safely across the world? Um, I don't know, Mark, if you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, let me let me go first, and perhaps if I concentrate on the on ITER itself and um, my take on that. And then maybe Matteo can put it in a, in a, in a broader context or, or join in on the ITER story. I mean, <clears throat> when you look at the collaboration and its remarkable features, I mean, a big part of this, and, you know, Matteo was really good in outlining all of the work that went on up to the, you know, the Geneva summits, all of the, all of the groundwork up to that key moment. Um, Part of this is, you know, the simple social science phenomenon of the fear of missing out. If you're one of the seven member states of ITER and you're locked in, the thought of withdrawing from this project is unthinkable because the results are needed by everyone. There are theories about, for example, plasma facing material and results, and there are people trying to jump the gun in terms of designs that are going to go into demo and other things. But you do not know until the E part of it is done. So you have to be in. And they will be pretty tight on the sharing and commercialization of that knowledge, they being the seven member states. Remember, European member includes all of Euratom plus uh, now um, Switzerland and the UK. Um, to make sure that they commercialize and get return for that in the end. So whilst it's the collaboration and everything we all enjoy about that and, you know, this breaking down of the barriers, there is also the underlying reason to make sure you're not left behind and that your community uh, gain from the knowledge that's been generated 
constantly. And of course, the sunk costs of those initial members are not trivial. So Canada, for example, was involved uh, and was going to be a partner at one stage, and for various reasons, not least their site was not selected, they dropped out. There's a whole backstory to do with the Candu reactors and tritium and everything else. But I would say there's very little chance of Canada now ever rejoining. They may have bilateral agreements with people like China, as with Canada. They have bilateral agreements for certain minerals with Kazakhstan and wherever. So there's a commercial angle to this in with the beautiful science, diplomacy and collaboration. Uh, so I hope that helps. Matteo, any, any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, no, first, this is very stimulating. I, I, I like, I like, I love this type of conversation. Uh, so I uh, mean, let, let me try to, so I'll try to answer your questions and to connect to some of the things that Mark uh, uh, mentioned. So you talked about, you asked about competition and I think competition is, is a good thing to have in general. Um, we're, we're at a moment right now in the, in, in fusion, um, like it's, 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 it's something new we're, we're witnessing um, at this scale. There's the emerging uh, private sector now in, in Fusion. There's been um, a surge of investments. Uh, there's uh, over 30 private sector companies at the moment all over the world. They're, they're okay, mostly maybe in the US, perhaps 80% of them are in the US, but it's they're everywhere now. They're proliferating in the UK, in Canada, in Europe, in China, in Japan. Um, so there is competition and there's competition, not just between the private sector companies, but also between private sector and public sector, because fusion has, has been a business, which has mainly been driven by uh, public sector, the public sector. So the labs and the research institutions and organizations, but these public sector institutes, they've also been competing between each other. So the thing which is happening and it's always, it's like, it's one of, it's one of the, one of the two ingredients of, of fusion. It's been collaboration and competition. The Fusion Energy Conference, which I already mentioned, uh, <laughs> you're getting the, the, maybe you understand it's one of my favorite conferences, uh, but the Fusion Energy Conference, if you go to one of them, you see how there is this competition in the air, but and most of, if not most, if not all of the papers presented, they've been developed in a collaborative effort. So between different labs, from the, around the world. So healthy competition, as I think competition is good as long as it's healthy competition. And fusion is, fusion is at uh, the luxury of these two ingredients. And I suspect it will continue to be like that um, for two reasons. One, one reason being this spirit, I see it with my eyes. It's passed down to the generations in the fusion field. And the second being just the nature of it, uh, fusion fusion will continue to be a collaborative endeavor because it requires uh, investments, it, it, it requires uh, ingenuity. Um, it, it is in the words of, I, I can quote to you, uh, you know, Lev Artsimovich is one of the forefathers of fusion. He's widely quoted and cited in, in all the fusion meetings, but there's one quote from him that I really love and it's usually not, not, not mentioned. But he said that during the overview uh, of the Geneva conference in 1958, the, the conference where fusion was declassified, and he says that the solution of the problem of thermonuclear fusion will require a maximum concentration of intellectual effort and the mobilization of very appreciable faci facility and complex apparatus. This problem seems to have been created especially for the purpose of developing close cooperation between the scientists and engineers of various countries. So this, you see fusion itself, requires all of that. Uh, for, for ITER, uh, I agree with what Mark said. In particular, for ITER, the IP determines, determines the time scale of the project because there is in-kind contributions. It's the way it's been set up and it's probably the best way also to set up, but Mark can correct me, but this type of, um, for this type of, um, of, of project. Um, something that you, I think there's a second part. There's a, there's a second uh, segment of your question, which is uh, how can science diplomacy help in this context? Okay, okay, I want to also here reconnect to something that Mark said when he, he mentioned Velikov being the first in physics in his class and, um, and Gorbachev being the first in law. I think this is brilliant. 
it, it, just the fact that you put together law and physics mm -hmm. it, it, and it's it i mean science that's what also science diplomacy entails right you want a level of science and a level of diplomacy in it and i can think of in my of my organization as at the agency uh, most of the IAA director generals have been experts in international relations or people having a degree in law. I can think of the recent, uh, the current director general, but also Hans Blix had a degree in international law. Um, so I think these two, they go together. And um, so, and so and that's why sense diplomacy is so important. So things like networks, uh, people, uh, coalitions or committees, councils, conferences, they'll continue to play a role. No, I mean, these, these personal relationships and having the right people in the right place at the right time. Um, on some of the major breakthroughs in science diplomacy, it has not been by accident. It has been by design. So when we look at the establishment of CERN, I mean, there's been many books written about this, many studies. But they managed to position in UNESCO uh, friends of the project and key officials and the director general, P.O. Orgut, who negotiated with the USA that there would be agreement to form CERN and to base it in Geneva. And this had been planned, it had been worked on and was achieved. And as, as, I, as I was trying to say, it, when I look at now how CERN organizes its work and divides up its entire field of research, it's a constant collaboration in keeping everybody as happy as they can be that they're getting a good, fruitful part of the pie. So they call this the noble work. So when we're breaking up in-kind contributions, it's not just that it's going to be the innovation and the intellectual property. It's going to be that some of the real cherries on the cake are divided up fairly. So this comes to the fore when an international science project hits problems. So for example, during Germany's reunification, Germany had to reduce its contributions to all of its science endeavors. And it just had to do it, there was no choice. So as the main contributor to CERN, they had to break it to the CERN council that Germany's contribution was going to be lower. This was just at the point when CERN really needed a lot of extra funding for the next big device and the um, LHC and everything that goes with that. So what did CERN decide to do? You know, they also had major contributors from the UK, Italy, um, France. And the remarkable solution was they dropped everybody's contributions by the same amount that Germany had dropped theirs. So that sounds counterintuitive that, hang on, you just told me that they needed more funds because of these extra devices they want to build. But the overreaching demand was that it was fair, that there was fairness in the international community. And that allowed CERN's council to be given the go ahead to borrow money in a way that hadn't been allowed before by the member states. So the European Investment Bank and everything else came into play. But that science diplomacy idea of fairness in voting when the CERN council meets, their decisions are more or less unanimous. They have incredible fights behind the scenes. ITA has various governance bodies and committees that have all of the um, aspects of the disputes between the members sorted out and recommendations given to the ITA council. So it's practiced every day to keep them all on board, to keep that collaboration fresh and to be absolutely scrupulously fair in how they divide up the in-kind and the in-cash contributions. So as there can be no uh, whatsoever thinking that there's favoritism here or favoritism there. The last thing to say, power about that is the host state relations are very, very special. So for example, France's relationship to the ITER project is different to Fusion for Energy, which includes France, as one of the collaborative members of the European partner. There is a separate agreement with France about what France itself provides to the project as part of the deal for the site to be in Calarache. 
So there is an international school in Manosk. There's a special itinerary road. There are special agreements reached to do with uh, customs clearance in Marseille. So all of these big facilities also have to keep the host state on board and all of its institutions and all of its internal wranglings have to be managed by that science uh, facility. Back to you, Pat. Thank you, Fusion for Energy. I might say that we that we are happy to host uh, in in Barcelona. Um, but just to flag two very two very interesting interesting things to say. You said, Mark, it's all about right having the right people at the right time in the right room, which I think is a very powerful message in creating conditions of fairness. But also, Matteo, going back to your comments, uh, something I really like, right? The, the value of collaboration at the, these organizations at the government to government level, uh, in order to. Um, invest in basic science and pool resources together in train engineers etc but also the value of you know once that is being done the spillovers that that's, that has into the private sector and the value of competition uh in the race to commercialize uh these these energy sources and at the end of the day create create a, a good business model around around fusion energy which is uh what what we would like to see i have a few interesting questions from the chat, I would like to start with Veronica, which I think raises a very interesting question on, right, how how do we gather public support for fusion? Veronica asks uh, and mentions that the IPCC has, has uh, raised questions around the use of nuclear energy, the waste it has, the potential security problems it has, etc. Um, and obviously, we're talking about fusion, which is different than, than uh, nuclear fusion um but when people hear about nuclear fusion they hear the word nuclear right and that connects them to some of the problems that we've had in the past and that we still have in terms of uh nuclear fusion so we know very different um nuclear fusion is you know, secure there's no super criticality you know use uranium uh, there's no waste or limited waste and you can explain that better but how how can we explain the differences between fusion and fusion in a matter that that everybody can understand and how can we become better into explaining and gaining support for for fusion uh, for fusion energy i don't know who if some of you can take this question if, if i can come in very quickly then i'll hand over to mateo so i mean one of the ways is you don't play around with communications you have a professional communication set up for these projects so if you look at it, if you look at the communications directorate and division, if you look at people who devoted their careers to this, like Sabina Griffith, who's the deputy, um, there is a constant education program, outreach, um, never ending, open, honest with mistakes. Um, but what I'm getting at is it's, it's not a trivial matter to get that communications right. CERN has a has a, a whole directorate to do with international relations and governance and everything else. And that doesn't come cheap. So that communication is not a cost, it's an investment for those programs that they've all got to meet and, and step up to. It's not an extra, the professional communications. It's part of the whole story. Yeah, I can add to this. I think so. This is not just uh, something like a feature of nuclear uh, or a feature of energy, especially. So if we talk about energy, I think this is a feature of all energies. Uh, there's no, there's no, there's no one size fits all. Uh, there, there will be different energy solutions for different countries, and all of them they carry positive and negative aspects, or positive or positive and less positive as aspects of it. Um, and but you can extend it to technology. We're now like on the on the cusp of the big discussion about artificial intelligence, and uh, even there, public engagement, communication about what AI is and how to uh, how to uh, guardrail it and uh, how to regulate it, it. It's becoming more and more important. Uh, so for fusion, it it it, it is. Um, it is something that the community is now because of what is happening, like the the, the background that I gave with the with the rising private sector, the investments and the scientific and technical advances we have witnessed. There, there were a series of breakthroughs just over the last 12, uh, 12, uh, 12 or 24 months. Uh, we're now thinking also we're, we're now uh, considering all of these aspects. 
of how to communicate fusion, uh, how to en engage the public. And so I think it is important, as Mark said, we need to invest into this, uh, into this uh, dimension. We need to think about communication. It needs to be done by professionals. Uh, they, but it's not just professionals. I think we need to bring together all the various stakeholders. We need to have, we need to bring this community together, um, including the public. And we need to have the, we need to have, con we need to hold consultations. Um, consultation, I think it's going to be key. It will be key for regulating fusion energy, but it will be key also for having fusion energy accepted by the public, which brings into consideration something known as social licensing, which is also a concept right now uh, very, um, very being discussed within the fusion community. Uh, so in here we could talk about energy justice and and, and all the, so all, all these all these issues. So yeah, that I, I think I would I would answer this question uh, in a more general way. And yes, and I would I would uh, recommend that we all engage in this discussion because it's it will not be just the, the professionals um, contributing to that. Completely, completely agree. And right, communicating effectively the differences between between fusion and, and fusion is really going to be going to be key to gather the public support necessary for it, for the commercial uh, commercialization of fusion energy at scale. I think one of the questions that was asked to that was related uh, partially to this, but some to some of the comments that we mentioned is. Um, and I think Ola Giwola, MCF, and Shirley have asked uh, similar questions. Um, is given that fusion is different than fusion, and we've seen that some of the problems uh, on you know making nuclear energy in general available to developing countries, you know, come with the national security uranium. Uh, discussion of of, of non-proliferation bits of the conversation because this doesn't happen with with fusion energy. Um, what can fusion mean for developing countries? Right, once we have a breakthrough and we commercialize fusion, mm -hmm. um, can we can can developing countries use it? How safely? Um, and what can what tools can we put in place to help them uh, adopt adopt fusion fusion energy? Okay, so once again, let me have a first stab at it, if you can, uh, if, you, if that's okay. Um, I think one of the outputs of, 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 of ITER and fusion research as a whole, obviously, is knowledge. It's like, it's like CERN. You know, the actual results are a naught and one. It's not until we get that DT plasma that we'll get the full scientific and technical results that we need. But we learn an awful lot along the way. We learn about better superconducting magnets. We learn about diagnostic tools, we learn about um, regulation, we, we learn about the entire jigsaw puzzle that's going to be needed to be learned from it to go into the demos, to then go into the reactors. Um, Christine Darve, who's a, a colleague of mine, has just posted in the chat some of the work that's going on in Africa to do with outreach about general physics education. But what I wanted to mention was, you know, in that, in that um, in that journey of knowledge, you know, there also, I'm afraid, Powell, there has to be expectation management. Fusion is hard. It's involving seven members <clears throat> that represent basically the, the cutting edge technical and innovation of the planet. And they are struggling to complete it on time and budget and keep the project going. They are doing, and eventually there will be results. But I think in with the communication um, effort, which I agree is not just professionals, it's everybody who is passionate about controlling climate change and making fusion the, the way forward, we have to manage expectations. This is still going to take a long time and there's going to still be mistakes and we still have to take chances. If you look at STEP, which is the U UK's uh, own um, attempt at nuclear fusion and has got funding and is a very exciting project. It's taking some chances. It's taking some risks. And I think that's the kind of expectation management that has to go with doing this thing quicker. It's hard. We're trapping a sun on earth 
and we're going to find out about plasmas and DT burning plasmas step by step. Back to you. Um, I, I think I, I'll, I just I can just part there what uh, what Mark uh, mentioned, uh, especially when we talk about we talk about ether. Ether is a knowledge centric organizations and much of this knowledge I think will be and can be transferred and um, if not um, if not by the if not directly by the ether members or as a as a as a mean of disseminating there are other bodies and organizations like the IAA that can bridge the they can bridge the ether members with the IAA members which um, they're more of the ether members and so you can have this you can there, there is a possibility for this knowledge transfer there are mechanisms for that but it will not just be knowledge transfer. Uh, it will also be technology transfer. Um, so, and this is what I meant when I, so we were talking about how, what, what, what will be the geopolitical implications of the widespread development of fusion. And I mentioned that uh, it would, uh, it would bring um, peace, international peace, but also it would, uh, it would, uh, um, it would bridge the global North, global South divide. And I think that's how it would happen. Um, um, so there are mechanisms for technology and, and knowledge transfers. Uh, the, the IA continuously that, that, uh, does that uh, right now. For example, we have something we call the, our technical cooperation program, which is implemented by the technical cooperation, the, the technical cooperation department. Um, and it, we exactly focus on, 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 the, on those aspects. We have other mechanisms of bringing together more developed with less developed countries to work on uh, research and development areas. And we do already that uh, in Fusion, we have, uh, we have a series of, we call them coordinated research projects, where we make sure that there is this knowledge and technology and technology uh, transfer. Uh, there's a capacity building education training activities, which can be, uh, are, are already uh, being uh, offered, not just by us, but also from by the ITER organizations and others. And this will just continue to continue to proliferate. Um, I think de developing countries, the global south, and newcom fusion newcomers are also. It, this is also becoming more of more of a uh, concern, and it's coming more into the picture. And um, more in general, that's why I like to talk about energy justice as being a theme uh, for the international fusion community to to really. Uh, tackle now and intentionally uh, bring bring up in the discussion and consider in the deliberations now at this stage. Just to add to that, I mean, what, one of the benefits, if you like, for the global south and, and for the planet is the back channel of communication that the ITER collaboration allows. You have a setup where Department of Energy and Department of State officials in particular can meet regularly with counterparts from Russia, from China, from South Korea and everywhere and communicate. Now, that may not sound very immediately rewarding for a developing nation, but I would argue it is. And it's very important that those kind of back channels in various science collaboration programs continue you know the space station is another classic example where many people argue the collaboration is much more important than the actual science that comes out of the space station and um, that's why what's going to happen as this space station ends its life is and china of course now has got its own space station in orbit comes into play so those big players being able to collaborate and talk and protect their national communities by being part of an international collaboration helps everybody and um, is not a trivial matter at all given how many barriers are going up with sanctions, trade barriers, isolationism, um, nationalism's ugly head being raised all over the place. You know, the classic line that science has no borders uh, is more true for me every year. You know, it's the same with sport events and sport diplomacy. These are very important things to keep going. I like this, this idea of intrinsic value of, of, of 
collaboration and bringing different countries together, but also wanted to highlight Matteo, what you said on, on anticipating the conversation on energy justice in the fusion community and making sure that we're talking and heavily investing in, in technology, in knowledge transfer, but also that we're anticipation, anticipating on you know when the uh, fusion energy is ready to be commercialized, we have financial instruments at, at multilateral development banks and, um, and regional financial institutions that help, you know, yeah. deploying uh, and bringing uh, in bringing fusion energy to scale um, um, for the decarbonization of developing countries. I wanted to end just on a last question that we, we have alluded to the topic a little bit about the conversation, but we focus more on governmental collaboration and international organizations but i wanted to pick your thoughts on what's happening on the private uh on the private sector right and and mark you've, you've mentioned right it's, we still we have to manage expectations and there's still you know uh, a long time for us to, to see fusion um commercialized but i think you also mentioned uh, that the rising investments in the private sector we're, we're seeing an increasing of startups mainly in the us but all over the world that are raising mm -hmm really substantial amounts of capital more than than five billion last year mm. if i'm not wrong and some are promising bringing um a fusion uh at a much smaller scale so we're talking a small a small fusion plants but uh fusion to market uh, by mid next decade so by 2035 um what what do you think of you know the role of the private sector in commercializing fusion and obviously how they learn and they, how they've learned from the progress advanced um, by collaboration between governments? No, I think there is you know for the want of a better term trickle down of the of the golden nuggets of knowledge and innovation in the in the private sector. Remember when the member states go out and contract for their their work in the homeland for their in-kind contributions. They do not have to do that in their own homeland only. They can get that from wherever the best practice is. And often they will scatter seeds to see which ones are going to bear fruit, you know, in the future. So they use it as a, as a, as a way of developing their national capabilities and having grants and having um, opportunities for startups with within the general work that they've got and the point i want to make there is that these international collaborations are very important for keeping the national structures strong so if i'm part of an international collaboration and my national budget is going to be cut which would go to startups and everything else i can say to the ministers and say to the finance ministers hold on a moment if you start to weaken my international collaboration this is altering my reputation globally and with other partners, you cannot mess up this collaboration. You must maintain my budget. Canada do this classically with their robotic arm on the space station, where it protects the Canadian Space Agency in many, many ways. And I think that's true in fusion as well. So having strong national programs, because they're part of an international collaboration, helps the whole uh, landscape of private and public. I think. So the, the emergence of the private sector in fusion is fantastic. And uh, this has energized the entire field. Uh, we talked about um, comp competitiveness and, and I mentioned that how actually how, how healthy, uh, so healthy competition is, is a good thing. And uh, in general, competition is a good thing. And how, what, it, what has happened with the private sector companies uh, coming, uh, joining this race for fusion power, um, uh, motivating uh, the public R&D sector and other private sector organizations. And, and this is bringing results uh, because it, it brings more attention uh, to fusion. It, it's, it's bringing new investments, new money are, are, are being uh, invested in this field. Um, so th this just the, the emergence itself, I take it as a, as a fantastic as a fantastic development, which uh, it is producing ripples and uh, we're seeing this uh, it, it, it's adding uh, it's giving momentum to the entire field um, in addition i think that in terms of cooperation so if we talk about ip for example and people are usually worried about ip when you talk um, in, in in the context of the private sector involvement uh, but i think and this is common to all industries um, 
And I think there will be parts of uh, what these private companies are working on, which for, in which they will be more, more open uh, to share. And so there will be opportunities for co cooperation and collaboration with the private sector uh, as there are with, with, among uh, public labs. Uh, there would be other parts which are not so open. They're not so open to share, but that's just normal. We, we should expect that. So there will be also opportunities there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mateo, Mark, for this conversation on the collaboration necessary to bring to bring fusion to reality, but also how competition is striving forward the conversation and the advancement of a potential energy source that's safe, that's clean, that's base load, and that has the potential to revolutionize our, our energy systems. So with that, thanks again for joining us. Alexis, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for, for, for the outstanding moderation. And thank you so much, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Barbarino, for this this enriching and enlightening conversation we had about fusion energy and the diplomatic aspect of it. As we have seen today, cooperation in, in, in science, research, and, and, and innovation can be a catalyst for, for transformative forms of energy production that could be a change of paradigm in sustainability and, and, and solutions to, to, to global energy crisis. Certainly, we can say that science diplomacy will contribute to accelerating the energy revolution by fostering cooperation in energy research and bringing us closer to limitless clean energy. I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you that if you would like to get certified in science diplomacy, applications for our science diplomacy summer school are still open. This unique immersive training program will take place the first week of July in the heart of beautiful Barcelona. And in its fifth consecutive edition, this university program organized by Cyrex Diplohat and eBay, together with other leading academic institutions, will allow you to build your knowledge and skills in science diplomacy and further your career into some of the topics we have been discussing today and that we'll be discussing in the upcoming set of talks at the intersection of science and diplomacy, including climate change, cybersecurity, AI diplomacy, uh, sustainable development, global health, and, and this study of different national and, and regional approaches and strategies to science diplomacy. Don't hesitate to reach out if you would like to, to join us in this uh, amazing summer school. Thank you so much and see you next week.